Hey guys, how are you? Zena, how are you? Did you watch my stream from yesterday, Zena? Hey, Zena. What a kind of fina. Hey, 1611 on my way to heaven. Braider. What's happening, everyone? Let's wait a few more minutes. Uh, you liked it, huh? Praise the God and Father of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Father, Son, and Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> we praise you, Father. Lord Jesus, we praise you. Holy Spirit, we praise you. Father, I come in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that you just cleanse us in the precious blood of Jesus, your beloved, the beloved of the Father, your heart become flesh. Cleanse us, Father. Purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Forgive us for our failures. Forgive us for our flesh and succumbing to the flesh and give us the power of the Holy Spirit to conquer the flesh to crucify the flesh, to walk in the life of the Spirit, power from your Spirit, to resist the flesh, Father, to be filled with fruit of the Spirit, to become more like Jesus Christ in love, in purity, in devotion, in holiness, in righteousness, in obedience, and in worship, Father. Help us to become more like Jesus, Father. And Father, sanctify me by your Spirit, Lord. I ask that you sanctify the motives of my heart, not to do it for the praise of men, but to do it to glorify Jesus Christ and to be used by your spirit to bless your people, to fall more in love with Jesus, Father. May we decrease, may Christ increase, Father, and save us from attacks of the evil one. Save me from being unnecessarily offensive, Father. Give me victory, the power to be self-controlled and self-restrained for the glory of Jesus, Father. And, Father, fill my lungs and my chest and my throat with the breath of life, with the health I need to glorify you, Father. And enable me by your spirit to recall the passages correctly and interpret them perfectly. Save me from stammering confusion and misinterpretation. And bless your people, Father, with wisdom from your spirit, knowledge from your spirit, power from your spirit, life from your spirit, and love from your spirit to love you, Father. To love the Lord Jesus and love your Holy Spirit and use these sessions for your glory. And please, Abba. Please, Father, please, Bobby, save us from the evil one. Save us from the world. Save us from this corrupt system. Save us from our own flesh and unite us to Jesus, to be in love with Jesus and to become more like Jesus and to delight the heart of Jesus, your son, because to make him happy is to make you happy, Father. And we need you, Lord. And Father, bless our loved ones, Lord. Those who are not here with us, bless them. Bless my daughters, my angels, Lord. Love them as only you can love them and bless them and keep them safe and secure and bring them to the feet of Jesus. And remind them that their earthly Baba loves them. They're in your hands, Father, and that's what matters. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, take over, please, and save me from my own wretchedness. And save everyone here and bless them for the sake of Jesus. You are the perfect teacher. We trust and you and depend on you in Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha in Jesus' name. All right, guys. Luckily, I had a comment asking if I was on Sam's block list, and so here I am after chat. Why would you be on my block list, Andrew Martin? Yeah, 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 right? I didn't get to watch all of that video, but yes, it was a blast. I had a great time, right? Be careful, man. I drink too much coffee. I got coffee-stained teeth. Hello! Right? Gila so. Gila so. I have no idea what that means. But good to see you guys. Man, we had a record yesterday. We have over 200. Praise the triune God. And it's not about numbers, but we want more people, quality people, to learn these arguments, learn how to interpret scripture, learn the, the truths of scripture, and live it out for the glory of Jesus. Amen. I love you too. Love you guys. And thank you for putting up with me and my imperfections. There was someone I'm hoping that would show up, Andrew Owen. We got a couple of Mohammedans. Yes, I know Andrew Martin. Uh, Andrew, I'll tell you why. Let me let me explain to you. I have coffee. Look. What is that? It's Turkish. Turkish? Maybe but later. Thank you so much. God bless you. So they don't know. God bless you. We have a wonderful sister, a precious sister in the Lord Jesus, who is allowing me to use her home and her internet to do these sessions until I find my own place. So God bless them and protect them and preserve them. They're a wonderful, godly Christian family. And I thank Jesus 
that I can get to know them and they treat me as family. So praise God for all of his children who are born of the same spirit. And because we're born of the same spirit, the spirit puts love in our hearts for the brethren. Praise the Father, Son, and Spirit for that gift in Jesus' name. Now, Protestant, I don't know where he's at. He's supposed to show up, I guess, or if it's first and last. But let me explain to you. Here's two reasons why I block people. Are you ready? Are you guys ready? Can I explain now? And I get people asking me the same question over and over again. Here's two reasons why I block people. Number one, I know my imperfections. I know my weaknesses. And my imperfection is I'm very impatient. I get angry very quick. These are my sins, my imperfections. I'm not proud of them. And my prayer is, Holy Spirit, crucify my flesh and save me from these imperfections and other things that I struggle with. And I'm asking for victory. And until I get victory, I need to avoid people that will cause me to sin and stumble. Number two, I block people who are not here to learn, but here to challenge me, to pontificate, to argue, right? So that's the whole thing. Uh, when I see people who are not sincere and people are here just to argue or try to pontificate or impress people with their knowledge, I block them. You get my point? So those are the two reasons. Let me repeat it so I don't have to repeat myself again. I do that so I don't stumble and sin against the Holy Spirit and grieve the Holy Spirit because, again, you guys know my issues. You guys know, and because of the grace of Jesus, you put up with it and you pray for me because you ignore the bad and focus on the good. I'm a work in progress. Remember what our Lord Jesus said. He did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance, right? Sinners to repentance because those who are sick are in need of a physician, right? Those who are sick are in need of a physician. Are you with me? As the Holy Spirit enables us to focus and learn. Right. And so what what do you expect to find? What do you expect to find in the church? Spiritually sick people. And I'm sick. You're sick. The Lord Jesus is healing us slowly but surely until our healing is complete. Now, our healing will either take place when we die or when Jesus comes down. So if we die before the second coming, then we will be whole. No more pain, no more suffering, no more disease, no more imperfections, no more flesh to struggle with. Or if Jesus comes down, he will then transform our bodies in a nanosecond. So these flesh bodies will no longer have sin dwelling in them, causing us to stumble. Amen? You with me so far, you understanding? Right. You, you with me there? Okay, so... Until I am perfectly whole, if someone's here that's going to cause me to get angry and lose my patience, I'd rather block them so I don't stumble in sin and be a stumbling block for others or put a weapon in the hands of my enemies to discredit my witness. That's number one. The second reason, the second reason is if I see someone, he's here, who's not open to learn another view or perspective, but wants to debate or chime in or pontificate and impress us with his knowledge, then I'll block him. If you guys want a debate, set up a debate. When I do a live stream, the purpose of the live stream is not to get into a debate, but to teach and educate by the grace of God's spirit. There is a time and place for debate. This is not it. I don't mind sincere questions. I don't mind even tough objections if someone's asking sincerely because they want an answer. With that said, if I'm in the midst of a topic and I'm in the midst of explaining a point, it is disrespectful to me and the people to ask me a question not related to the topic to get me off topic. So is that clear, everyone? Why I block people? Is that clear? Okay, everyone clear on that? I just want to make sure you're paying attention. We're focusing because we're about... To begin, for example, Andrew Martin is a professing atheist, even though in his heart he's in love with Jesus and he aches for Jesus. And he'll come back admitting that he believes in Jesus Christ. But until he does, I don't block him because he is a quote unquote atheist who doesn't come here to attack me, to mock the faith, to blaspheme Jesus, but to learn. Now, what he does with the information is between him and God. You with me there? And do hit that like button. Hopefully we get... We get our numbers increase. 
Yeah, see? I'm an agnostic atheist. See, you know he's he's pulling our leg. Right? Guys, pray for me, man, because my, my body structure, I was born with narrow shoulders. So even when I was a bodybuilder and I had to, like 220 pounds, my shoulders are always narrow. I had to really kill myself to try to get huge, you know, but I lost it, but it's coming back. And by the way, do you see the shirt? Do you guys see the shirt? You see the shirt here? Okay, do you see it? Bruce Lee, right? Do you know why I'm wearing the shirt today? Does anyone have an idea why I'm wearing the shirt today? Today is November 27. November 27 was Bruce Lee's birth date. He was born November 27, 1940. 1940. November 27. Okay? So if he's born in 1940, November 27, on this date, it's 2019. How old would he be? 79? He would have been 79 years old. And you guys understand that I really love this guy. In fact, let me tell you, growing up, who were the influences on my life that were not believers? Bruce Lee had the biggest influence on my life. He did, I have to admit. And believe it or not, Batman too. This fictional character, Batman, affected me. Batman, because I grew up on Batman cartoons and comics. Hulk Hogan. I loved Hulk Hogan. Arnold Schwarzenegger. These were some of the biggest influences in my life. And believe it or not, another fictional character. I'm just telling you the people that affected me. Rocky Balboa. Now, you guys may think this is funny because I'm bald now. But if uh, my buddy Al, by the way, I've told you, I'm going to say it again, Al Darius is one of the dearest brothers to my heart, Al Darius. Me and him go way back. He remembers me in my pre-Christian days. I don't know if he remembers. If I can find old pictures, I'm not lying. You're going to laugh at me. You're going to laugh at me. When I had hair and I was muscular, I used to look like Sylvester Stallone, and I had people call me Rocky. But I'm talking about the good-looking version of Rocky, not Rocky 1 with, Yo, Adrian, Adrian. I'm not lying. I know you guys think, no way. I am not lying. If I could find a picture when I had hair and I was muscular, I looked like Rocky in Rocky 5, you know? not Yeah, I know you're like, come on, man. You must be smoking. Well, no, I don't smoke, right? So Hulk Hogan, Bruce Lee, Batman, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Rocky. I used to fantasize being the Assyrian Rocky, always looking for my Adrian. Still, still looking for her, though. Sai Bukhani, I grew up in Chicago. Chicago, mm -hmm. Chicago. Yo, Adrian! Adrian! <laughs> anyway, with that said, you see why I have a Bruce Lee shirt on today? Today's his birthday. He would have been, what, 79, 1940? Yeah, 79 years old. Tragic, he died when he was 32. Okay, now, with that said, by the grace of God, you see that I'm titling these sessions after Zachary Naik. The reason why I'm titling it after Zachary Naik Two reasons. Number one, I was bored the other day and decided to watch a good comedy, so I started watching Zachar Naik. He's probably one of the greatest comedians <clears throat> the world has ever known because he is one of the biggest Muslim clowns who makes Muhammad look <clears throat> serious and intelligent. He's a joke, and yet this guy is so popular that his videos gets, what, hundreds of thousands of views, right? So I was bored, and I decided that I wanted to watch a good comedy, so I started listening to Zachary Naik. Now, I told you yesterday that I have a lisp problem. Man, this guy's lisp makes mine <clears throat> appear non-existent. The brother said, chapter 2, verse 79, and the Bible, chapter 7. He is tortured to listen to. So he, I decided to go back and look at some of the arguments that Muslims use, because Zachary Naik is simply repeating the arguments of Ahmad Didat, who was his idol. I promise you, if you take Ahmad Didat's clips and then take Zakir Naik's clips when they're talking about the same thing, Zakir Naik parrots Ahmad Didat word for word, even in his analogies. That's how pathetic this guy is, an idolater because he salivates at Ahmad Didat, another clown like him. So that's so. I decided to revisit some of his arguments. And by putting his name in the title, it will draw Mohammedans with the hopes that by the grace of God's spirit, they'll hear the responses to his butchering of scripture. 
Yeah, Orthodox believer, I wonder that too. Anyway, before I begin addressing some of the passages, do you have any questions related to specific passages in Scripture that you'd like me to address? Because yesterday, I think Billy Sunday, I don't think he's here, he asked me a question. And see, I don't get to read all the comments because they go by pretty fast. And it was a question that I said I was going to answer now, but I forgot. And I'm looking for Andrew Owen. I told him to come here because he's another guy, an ignoramus, who thinks that he's articulate and intelligent, who accused me of sounding Nestorian. But that only shows to me that he's another chief who should be an Indian who pontificates on matters that he has no business addressing. So I'm hoping he's here. Andrew Owen, if you're here, give me a shout out. Do you have a video explaining why I cannot call myself a son of Jesus? Uh, Ram Bucks, I don't know if you're asking me sincerely as a Trinitarian or as a modalist heretic. So are you asking me sincerely, Ram Bucks, or are you just asking to be silly so I can know what to do? Okay, Keith, uh, sh uh, you know, shoot your best shot, and I'll try to answer. So are you sure, Rambox, if I go to your YouTube channel, will you be exposed for pretending to be something you're not? Yeah. Okay, Orthodox believers, okay. Yes, Stephen Baptiste, you can view Nestorians as Christians. Can I explain why? Nestorian is the term given to the Syriac-speaking churches, the Assyrian Christians, of which I belong to, Stephen Baptiste. I belong to the Nestorian church. I was baptized in the Nestorian church. My parents were baptized in the Nestorian church. Al Dario, she was here, was baptized in the Nestorian church. Assyrians, for the most part, are part of what's called the Nestorian church. However, the Nestorian church has never believed, never held to two persons, a divine Christ and a human Jesus uniting. That was an accusation leveled against them falsely. And Stephen Baptiste, if you want the proof that Nestorians have always believed in the uni personality of Christ, that Christ is one eternal divine person who has two natures, a divine nature, human nature, Google, Google, you see, I'm going to tell you, go to Sheikh Google, get all your answers on Google, put in, I'm going to have to spell it out, Mar Dincha the fourth, okay? Mar Dincha the fourth and Pope John Paul. Are you with me there? Here, I'm going to spell it out here in the comment section. If you go to Sheikh Google, you'll see that in, I believe it was 1994. Don't quote me on the date. It was in the early 90s. Mar Dincha met the then known Pope and signed a Christological confession of faith, agreeing that both churches held to the same view of Jesus. And they signed that declaration showing the Nestorian church holds to the same view of Jesus that the Roman Catholic, the Orthodox church holds to, that Christ is one eternal divine person who took on an additional nature. He's two natures, one person. And there are actually confessions and statements by some of the Nestorian church's theologians and bishops in the sixth century, where they bear witness to Jesus being one person with two natures. So they were falsely accused of something that they did not hold to. You want me there, Stephen Baptiste? Indeed, he has, Nahav. Okay. So, yes, Nestorians do hold to the same view of the Trinity and the person of Christ. Okay. Uh, Rambax, you're assuming that Revelation 21, verses 6 to 7, is about Jesus. What's your proof? What's your proof, man, in Revelation 21, verses 6 to 7? It's Jesus speaking and not God the Father. Just because the Father and the Son share the same titles doesn't make them the same person. There are titles attributed to the Father, Rambox, that are also attributed to the Son, not because they're the same person, but because they're the same God. they are different persons who possess the same titles because they share the same essence. So you're assuming Revelation 21 is about Jesus. It could be, but why do you assume that when no, nothing in the context explicitly identifies the speaker as Jesus Christ as opposed to God the Father, right? Now, I was asked another good question. I wanted to, oh, icons. All right. 
Let me answer this question. Are you ready? No, uh, JC saves. There are no Eastern Assyrians that embrace Arius's view of Jesus. That is slander. Don't falsely slander my brothers and sisters. Assyrians do not hold, not in their official creeds and doctrines, to the Arian view of Jesus because they do not believe Jesus is a creature. They believe he's eternally God, the eternal son who became flesh. So JC saves. That is slander against the Assyrians. Brother, you can hear whatever you want. Muslims say that we worship three gods. And so Muslims hear from other Muslims that we Christians worship three gods. God, Jesus, and Mary. I don't care what you've heard. What I want you to do is prove it by citing their official statements. Okay? Don't go by hearsay. People accuse others of a lot of things that they don't hold to and believe in. Right? Don't go by hearsay. Cite official statements from their official documents from their scholars who are recognized as such speaking on behalf of their church that says that Jesus is a creature because that's what Arius believed. Everyone want me there? I don't care what someone told you. Cite to me the official creeds, <clears throat> sources, scholarly references from a particular church, from a particular denomination that tells me this is what they believe and then I'll say you're right. Because if you ask the average person, I promise you, here, I even promise you, I can go around interviewing evangelical Christians that are supposed to be Trinitarian, that go to Trinitarian churches that sound modalist, that will confuse Jesus with the Father and think that he is the Father. Should I then assume that evangelical Trinitarians are modalists that think Jesus is the Father? That's not how you deal with with a particular church meeting. If you want to address the particular beliefs of a particular group, go to their sources and see what their sources teach and what their adherents are supposed to believe, even though many of them may not believe that because they're ignorant of their sources. It's the same thing with Muslims. Most Muslims are not terrorists. Most Muslims think ISIS is an abomination. But most Muslims are wrong because most Muslims don't know that their prophet was a terrorist and ISIS is more closely following Muhammad than they are. You hear me there? So as children of the God of truth, as servants of Jesus Christ, who's truth in the flesh, as those filled with the spirit of truth, we are called to speak the truth, affirm the truth, live out the truth, and love the truth, no matter what the cost. And so we cannot misrepresent what another group believes because that's dishonoring to the God who is true. Do you want me there? So I really don't care what a person thinks his church believes. Because that person may be ignorant of his church's belief. I don't know yet, James uh, 1611. I still have to get out of my problems before I can set a date uh, to debate. So, because I still don't know if I'm out of the woodwork. God forbid you may be sending me postcards in prison. God forbid. And not for any crime I've committed. I've committed no crime by the grace of God. But because of a corrupt system. I don't know. I really don't know what's going to happen. So let's take it day by day by the grace of the triune God. Now, I was asked by Orthodox about icons. I want to answer that question. Can I answer that question? Because I think, thank you, Cloudy. I, I can do prison ministry without being in prison, but thank you. Okay, can I answer the question about icons? Can I give you what I believe to be the biblical answer? And Tippy Bear, I try to find you on Skype. I can't find your name. I couldn't find your name. I kept searching. You didn't pop up. You're a ghost. Right. So anyway, Orthodox, was that you? You asked me the question first last. Will you be able to post verses? Because Protestants not here. Icons is what the Orthodox Church have images. Cat Roman Catholics have statues. The Orthodox Church has icons. You know, those drawings, those paintings that you find in the Orthodox Church. OK, 
Does the Bible condemn icons? Yes and no. Let me repeat again. Yes, but they call we call them statues, Orthodox believer. We call them statues, right? You don't have statues. You have what we call icons, meaning you have what, you know, images, like it looks like paintings, right? Am I correct, Orthodox? So that's why we would call one of them icons, the other a statue. But basically, yes. Okay. Let me again repeat. Okay. Does the Bible condemn icons? Yes and no. Yes, they don't use icons closed on Sunday. There's certain churches that are Nestorian don't have icons. What do I mean by yes and no? The Bible does condemn icons that you worship as gods and goddesses. Okay? But the Bible doesn't condemn icons <clears throat> that are not worshipped as gods and goddesses. Okay, can I repeat that again? And I'm going to give you proof, all right? Are you ready for the proof? Okay, let me repeat again. The Bible condemns icons, images that are taken as gods and goddesses to be worshipped. However, however, the Bible does not condemn icons or images if they're not taken as gods or goddesses to be worshipped. You with me there? Did you hear what I just said? Because I want to give you the proof. I will, Truth Apologetics, if you just be patient, brother. Be patient. I just want to make sure you're following me. Yes, 16 and 11, Medic already gave it. Let's first see what God actually condemns. Let's go to Exodus 20, verses 1 to 5. And Gideon smashed an image of Baal, Baal, because that was an image in honor of the false god Baal that the Israelites were worshiping. Okay, Exodus 20, verses 1 to 5. Thank our brother first last for serving me to serve you. Read with me. And God spake all these words, saying, I am Jehovah thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now pay attention. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I am Jehovah thy God, am a jealous God. Right? I'm a jealous God. Did you catch what he said? Don't make images of anything in heaven, on earth, and the seas below that you bow down to and worship as a deity. Now, if this is a blanket statement saying you can't have images of any kind for any reason, God is going to contradict himself in Exodus 25, verses 18 to 20. Exodus 25, verses 18 to 20. So God's going to contradict himself in a matter of four chapters, from chapter 20 to 25, because in Exodus 25, verses 18 to 20, notice here what it says. Exodus 25, 18 to 20. And thou shalt make, he's telling Moses, to fashion two cherubims. That's an image of spirit creatures, of gold, of beaten work. Shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat. Shall the faces of the cherubims be? Wait, 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 wait. God, I thought you said no images. Yes. Now in Exodus 25, you're telling Moses to fashion the image of two cherubs. And overlay them with gold, guarding the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, which represents your throne in heaven. And they even have wings. Why are you having Moses fashion an image of something in heaven? Because God's going to say, because you don't understand my command. In Exodus 20, I was not saying you can't have images for any reason. I said you can't have images that you worship as gods and goddesses in place of me. Right? And then take a moment to read 1 Kings chapters 5 all the way to 7. Write this down. We don't have time to look at it. 1 Kings chapter 5 all the way to 7. You can look and read verse 8. When Solomon built the temple, it says on the walls of the temple, there were cherubim, bulls, and trees like pomegranates. Why is Solomon decorating the walls of the temple, the house of worship to God, with images on the walls? And then it says that Solomon fashioned 
12 lions because he had a throne and six steps leading up to the throne. On each side, there were lions. 12 lions. What in the world is Solomon doing with images of lions by his throne? Are you with me there? Are you catching it? Is it making sense? What's my point? My point is the Bible doesn't condemn images, icons. It condemns images that you take as gods and goddesses to be worshipped in the place of God. That's what he's condemning. Have no image of anything that you believe to be a god or a goddess worthy of your worship. But to have an image... Nothing wrong with it, unless you believe God contradicts himself. And the ultimate proof, God has no, no problem with icons. Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9, specifically verses 8 to 9. Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9, specifically verses 8 to 9, the bronze serpent. One, one of you mentioned it. See, Ron mentioned it, the brazen serpent, which Jesus said was a picture of him on the cross. Okay, here, let's read. Numbers 21, 4 to 9, Nehushtan. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Right? And the people spake against God and against Moses, Where have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord Jehovah, Yehovah, sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against Yahovah, Jehovah, and against thee. Pray unto Jehovah, Yahovah, that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Now notice what God says the remedy is. God is telling Moses, here's the remedy. And Jehovah said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. Whoa, 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 whoa. God, what are you doing? I thought you said to Moses in the Decalogue, No images of anything on earth, of anything that crawls. Why are you having Moses make an image of something that calls a serpent and then on top of that, put it upon a pole and it came to pass, right? And it's come to pass that everyone that has been one day looketh upon it shall live. You're even having them look to that image? God, you are having them look to the image for healing? <whistles> and Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole and it came to pass that if a serpent had bit any man, when he, had, he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Why is God contradicting himself? Not only does he have Moses fashion an image of something on earth that crawls, he's telling the people, you want to be healed from the venomous bites of those fiery serpents? Look to that image and you'll be healed. Why doesn't he just heal them directly? The reason why, Al Darish, you never thought about it? Because you, like me, have been indoctrinated too much by Protestant tradition. Protestant tradition. That's why we need to get back to the Bible and trust the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth, to understand the Bible, live it out for the glory of Jesus. And then Jesus uses this as a picture of him being lifted on the cross on his way to glory. John 3, 14 and 15. John 3, 14 and 15. Okay. So the honest biblical answer is God is not against icons or images that you don't worship as gods and goddesses. He's not against it. That's the honest answer biblically. Okay. Okay. No, Bob Baker, it's not a bit far because, again, bowing to someone or an image of someone is not an act of worship because, Bob Baker, you're now going to accuse the Israelites of worshiping David. And I'll explain that in a minute. Just be patient. And I'll get there, Bob Baker. I'll explain. Just be patient. Just let me get there, I promise you, because I was anticipating that objection. Okay, John 3, 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Who's appealing to that image? Jesus is. He's saying that image of that serpent is a picture of me being lifted up. So when you look to me, as they look to the serpent, I will heal you of your spiritual venom, sin. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Everyone see that? By the way, folks, did you know who commanded Moses to fashion the bronze serpent according to the New Testament? 
Guys, if you can, don't get into side debates about icons. Let me address it and pray the Holy Spirit will guide you all truth. And if I'm wrong, convict me to repent of my error and save you from any mistakes I make. But don't get into side debates. Please, just focus. Remember Numbers 21, it says that Jehovah sent fiery serpents because they tempted him, right? Jehovah did it, right? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10 verse 9 to see, according to Paul, who was the Jehovah who sent fiery serpents to bite the Israelites as punishment? For tempting him. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ. Pay attention. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Bam. Did you catch it? Paul said they were tempting Christ in the wilderness. And it was Christ who sent the serpents to bite them dead. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 9. One more time. Post it. One more time. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. So according to Paul, it was none other than Christ who told Moses to fashion the bronze serpent. And then Christ comes 1,500 years later and saying that bronze serpent was a picture of me being lifted on the cross. Catching it or no? Before I move on, did you catch it or no? Uh, for Fire Fist, you're a liar and a son of Satan like your filthy prophet who is a son of Satan. Nowhere will you find Barnabas saying that Paul was an antichrist, but I will show you Barnabas and Paul saying that Muhammad is a son of Satan. You wicked liar. I know you're like your prophet. You're a liar. Okay, did everyone get it? Did everyone catch it? Did you guys catch that according to Paul, it was Jesus in the wilderness who sent the serpents to bite the Israelites dead for their rebellion. And it was Jesus Christ who told Moses, then make a bronze serpent. And then 1,500 years later, Jesus refers to that bronze serpent that he commanded Moses to fashion as a picture of him. But now what happened when Israel started worshiping the bronze serpent as a god? What happened when Israel started worshiping the bronze serpent as a god? 2 Kings 18, verses 1 to 4. Specifically, verse 4. 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. Specifically, verse 4, as the Holy Spirit enables me to recall these passages and interpret them correctly for the glory of Christ. Pay attention now. 2 Kings 18, verses 1 to 4. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began... Sorry, too fast. Okay. Began to reign. 20 and 5 years old. He was 25 years old. Was he when he began to reign? And he reigned 20 and 9 years. 20 and 9 years? I don't, I, I don't know math. 59 years old was he? 54? Anyway, who cares? Yeah, 54. His mother's name was also was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did which was right in the sight of Jehovah. According to all that David his father did. Okay. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces. The brass serpent that Moses had made for unto those days, the children of Israel did burn incense to it and called it Nahushtan. You see why God had Hezekiah destroy the bronze serpent of Moses? Hit the like button, guys. Come on now. Did you catch it? Because they started worshiping the bronze serpent along with the other images of gods and goddesses. Anytime you find in the Bible high places, that's a reference to an Israelite or a Jew building an altar to gods and goddesses and having images of gods and goddesses that they worship and sacrifice to. That's what high places mean. They find a high place to build an altar to offer sacrifices to gods and goddesses and their images. Are you there? So why did Hezekiah destroy the bronze serpent? Because they started worshiping it as a god along with the false gods and goddesses. You're getting it here? Before I move on to the next point. Now, is bowing down, bowing down, 
necessarily an act of worship, meaning an act that you only do for a deity. In other words, if you see someone bowing to another or even to a statue that represents, let's say, a figure like Paul or Mary or Gabriel, does that necessarily mean that's an act of worship being given to a deity? No, not at all. Not even kissing. No, close on Sunday. How do I know? Go to 1 Chronicles 29, verse 20. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 20. Well, the Japanese culture is not biblical culture, and I'll explain why they do it. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 20. Here, here's the answer. I'm trying to be biblical, and my response is trusting the Spirit to save me from error. 1 Chronicles 29, 20. And this took me years of reflection to get to this point. I wasn't always at this point, but that's where the Holy Spirit sanctifies us to think like God, to think more biblically, and to live more righteously. That's his work in us. Now watch, here. First Chronicles 29, 20. And David said to all the congregation, Now bless Jehovah your God. Now pay attention here. And all the congregation blessed Jehovah God of their fathers and bowed down their heads and worshiped Jehovah and the king. Bam. They bowed down to God in heaven and David the king. And it says they worship God in heaven and David the king. Which one of you would accuse the Israelites of worshiping David as a god because they bowed down to him in the same context that they bowed down to God? Did you catch that verse? Hishtichava, shecha, which in Greek it's proskeneo. Did, post it one more time because I know a lot of you are shocked. What? Sam, what are you talking about? What? I'm giving you Bible, folks. You said you want to be biblical, right? Not traditions of men. Here it is. First Chronicles 29, 20, Thomas Yo. And David said to all the congregation, Now bless Jehovah your God. And all the congregation blessed Jehovah God of their fathers and bowed down their heads and worshiped Jehovah and the king. There you go. Come on, hit that like button. We had about 200 yesterday. Which one of you would say to me, which one of you would say to me that they were worshiping David as God because they bowed down and worshiped to him in the same context that they bowed down and worshiped Jehovah? And if that's the case, why didn't Jehovah or David or any prophet there rebuke them and stop them? So, What's my point? How does this apply to, let's say, to Orthodox and Catholics? I don't know of any, again, I have to be careful because there are people who may not know better, who may, do, who may be taking these figures as gods or goddesses, but their church would rebuke them and silence them for doing so. The word is worship, Daryl Nutt. You still didn't get the point. The word is the same in connection with Jehovah and David, it says in the Hebrew, it's Ishtachava, Shacha, Greek proskeneo. They did this act for God and David, which is rendered as worship. So, Daryl, not I'm going to turn it against you. When they performed this act to Jehovah, was it an act of worship? See, Daryl, not is not getting it because I don't know if he just came in. The text says this act of Ishtachava. Shecha for short, which Greek is proskeneo. That's the Greek word. When they did this proskeneo to Jehovah, were they worshiping Jehovah? They weren't worshiping Jehovah? No? Really? What were they doing? Read it. It's in front of you. Don't let your tradition blind you or make you hesitant to accept what's in the text. Daryl Nutt, you're not going to bounce you now, right? Latreo is not the only word for worship. And can you tell me what the Hebrew word for latreo is? Because now I'm going to bounce you. You're not coming back anymore. Because I asked the question you didn't answer to tap dance because you're devoted to your tradition. You're leaving right after you answer this question. The word used in this passage was in an act of worship to Jehovah there or not before I block you. Because I am blocking you. I'm done with you. Hold on, this guy's going to go. So he's got to answer. I'm going to block him if he doesn't answer. Exactly. No, no, I am, Daryl. 
because you're being a smart aleck, and it's not the first time, and I told you don't play games with me. In the context, when it says they worship Jehovah, it's not the word latruo. The Greek is proskuneo, but the Hebrew is shacha. Was that an act of worship to God? Why would you introduce latreo, all right, latruo, which is the Greek for the Aramaic verb, use the Aramaic portions of the Old Testament, pilach. We're talking about context when it says they bow down and worship Jehovah. Let me test every one of you to see how committed you are to the Bible or to your tradition. When it says they bow down their heads and worship Jehovah, would any of you deny the word worship means they're worshiping Jehovah as God? Would any of you deny it? Okay. But then it says this act they gave to God and the king. Why are you guys afraid to admit the passage is saying that this act of worship is given to God and the king, God in heaven and the king on earth. Why are you guys afraid to obey the Bible, accept the Bible, follow the Bible? Because you Protestants are just as guilty of what you accuse Orthodox and Catholics of, tradition that you don't want to let go of. Okay, so now... What's the point? No, it doesn't mean they were worshiping David as God. No, the Israelites knew better and David would not accept that kind of worship. What it means is that bowing down to someone isn't necessarily an act of worship to a deity. You can bow down to someone in worship, quote unquote, in recognition of his status out of respect, not out of worship to a deity. See, this guy's not listening, Daryl Nunn. Okay, brother, I'm sorry, man. I got to do this to you, bro. You got to go. Sorry, bro. No hard feelings. Hold on. Did you get it? Did everyone understand what I just said? Bowing down in quote-unquote worship is not necessarily an act of worship to a god or goddess. The Bible is replete with examples where people bow down in, quote-unquote, worship to a figure that they know is not God, is not divine, and they're not worshiping him as God, but are, quote-unquote, worshiping him in recognition of his status and position and honoring that status. What's your problem, man? Can't you accept what the text says? Let's look at it again. First Chronicles 29, 20. I don't understand why you guys say you love the Bible. You want to be biblicist, but you're having a hard time with the Bible. Why? The Bible is the word of God telling you what you're supposed to believe. So if you believe something not in the Bible, why do you believe it? Believe what's in the Bible. Come on. The point closed on Sunday is bowing down to an icon cannot be condemned as worshiping a deity. That's my point closed on Sunday. So just because you have someone kissing an icon, right, or bowing to an icon, you can't necessarily assume they are worshiping that icon as a deity. That's the point I'm trying to get at, especially if you ask the person, do you believe that person is a god or a goddess? And they'll tell you, hell no. Excuse my language. I don't worship John the Baptist as a god. I bow to his statue in honor of his position. You may not be comfortable with that, but biblically, and I promise you, biblically, you have no objection against it. You don't. And I'm being honest. You do not have a good biblical argument against it. You may think you do. You don't. That's my point. Not every act of worship is an act of worship in recognition of someone being a god or goddess. 
There are acts of worship, and I put in quotation marks, that are performed in honor of the person in recognition that that person is exalted and has a high position before God. Me too, Vine. Folks, I grew into this position. Years ago, I threw out a statue of Mary because I thought it was idolatry. But now I believe the Holy Spirit has helped me mature in my thinking to be more biblical. I was wrong. I grew in my understanding. I didn't always see this way. That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit working in you. He sanctifies you to become more like Jesus in the way you think. The way you live, the way you speak, the way you dress, and the way you love and worship. So he takes you from being a babe and then helps you mature until you attain full spiritual maturity. You, you with me here now? I'm trying to be biblical. If you have a problem with it, okay. Go listen to some other person's view to see if they have better arguments than the ones I've set forth. And I'm letting you know. I'm letting you know. I've heard both sides. And I'm being honest to the Lord to the best of my ability. I'm imperfect. I may be blind. And I trust the Holy Spirit to help me see and correct me for the glory of Jesus. There is no good, let me repeat again, no good biblical argument that would condemn the veneration of icons or statues as worship as idolatry. None. Because the passages they cite are all about idols, statues, icons in honor of gods and goddesses that the people wrongly worship as deities. You with me there? I, I promise you, any passage you quote to me will be about Worshipping someone as a god or goddess. Having an image that you worship in recognition of that person which the image represents as a god or goddess in place of Jehovah. I promise you that's what you're going to find. Daryl Nutt, in the official pronouncement of the Catholic Church, they will tell you, Idolatry is a sin. It's a mortal sin. And you are not to worship idols or worship gods or goddesses. That's their official belief. That tells you that they are not having their adherents venerate statues of Mary or of Paul or Peter as gods and goddesses because in their official teaching, idolatry is condemned as a mortal sin that will land you in hell. See, now notice again, see this ignoramus. They worship Mary as the mother of God. How do you answer that? However, let me not qualify. There may be people in the Catholic Church or in the Orthodox Church who have venerated Mary in their heart to such an extent that they have turned her into a goddess in their heart and they need to be rebuked and checked and told to repent. But that's the difference between what the church officially teaches and from its adherents. Remember what I said in the beginning? Not everyone understands what their church or religion teaches. Not everyone. So you have to take it by a case-by-case -case basis. Case-by-case -case basis. Uh, Jesus is our Passover lamb. Did you know that that same book of Revelation, Jesus will have Jews bow down at the feet of Christians and worship at their feet? Revelation 3, 9. That tells you that John in Revelation in his ecstatic frenzy was giving an honor to this angel that belonged to God, meaning that the text shows that he was going above and beyond what was acceptable because that act was an act of worship that signified the angel as being a god. How do I know? Because the angel said, worship God. Meaning that John lost himself for a moment in an ecstatic frenzy because of the revelation and the glory of the being he saw. 
so that what he was doing was idolatry. How do I know that? Revelation 22, 8 to 9. I don't know about lighting candles. I have to foresee a biblical basis where people could light candles. I That I can't answer. I don't want to go beyond what is written. Okay, let, let me prove to you that what John did, he forgot himself in an ecstatic frenzy from the, from the glory of the being he saw and from the revelations he was seeing that he lost himself for a moment into idolatry. How do I know? Revelation 22, 8 to 9. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou, do, do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Okay. The angel's response tells me that John forgot himself for a moment and was doing something that was idolatrous. In other words, he was giving excessive veneration to a being as to a God, and he needed to be corrected, which goes back to the point I was making earlier. What was my point earlier? You may have people, you may have people who are venerating angels or saints excessively, so it borders on idolatry, that they're giving them a devotion that rivals devotion that's to be given to God alone. Those people need to be reined in, checked, and told to repent. You with me there? So you take it by a case-by-case -case basis individually, individually. For example, if I see Nana kissing a picture of the Blessed Mother of our Lord or the Apostle Paul, and I say, Nana, why are you doing that? Are you worshiping Paul? No, I'm not. Paul is just a human creature. Greatly used by God, and my kiss is to show honor and respect for my brother in the Lord who's now glorified in God's presence. What do I say to that then? Bob Baker, which part of David was venerated by Israel's Israelites that God put up with isn't clear? Because now I'm going to bounce you for that stupid, ignorant comment because now you're being an ignorance and you're being stupid. Did you read First Chronicles 29:20? Did God put up with, quote, unquote, a little veneration to David when he allowed Israel to worship David? Answer quick because you're getting bounced for being a, an ignoramus, a brain ass. Exactly, El Darius. You kiss your dad's picture. I kiss my daughter's picture. But we are worshiping them as gods and goddesses. Answer, Bob Baker, because I'm sending you on your merry way. This is not for you. No, actually, it's against the intention, not just the act. And you're an ignorance. You're a fool who doesn't know the Bible, which is why you can't answer First Chronicles 29, 20. You moron. And you wonder why I'm harsh with people. A brain ass, not brain ass. Brain ass. See, this is another man who loves his tradition more than the Bible. Now, for the rest of you, are you with me there? Are you with me there? For the rest of you. And may the Holy Spirit protect me from error and going beyond what Scripture teaches. So I want to be very cautious for the rest of you. Let me show the inconsistency of every one of you who are against icons and images. Do you know that every time and any time you watch a Jesus film or a Jesus cartoon or pick up a Bible for children with images of Moses and Aaron and Abraham and David, then you're committing idolatry too if you're going to be consistent? Do you know that? If you're going to be consistent, be cons consistent across the board. If you're against all images, stop watching The Passion of the Christ. Stop watching Jesus of Nazareth. Stop buying children's book that are filled with cartoon images of all the major biblical characters, especially Jesus. Stop that and be consistent if that's how you're interpreting the Bible. Be consistent, right? If God is against images of all kinds for whatever purpose, 
That's what you believe. That's what you believe. Be consistent. No more Jesus films. No more Jesus cartoons. No more children's books where you have images of biblical characters, of angels, of Abraham, of you name it. Stop. Be consistent. Even the golden calf, they were worshiping them, Bill Mandalay, as gods. Because what did they say? Israel, behold your Elohim, right? So why did God get upset? Because they built the calves to worship the calves as their Elohim, their gods in place of Jehovah, who was there in the cloud on the mount with Moses, giving them the Decalogue. You with me there? You're asking me to give you my honest understanding of scripture. This is it. Now, this took me years to come to this position. Ten years ago, I would have condemned this. But that's my prayer. My prayer is, Holy Spirit, please save me from error. Save me from being a crowd pleaser. Save me from being unnecessarily offensive. Save me from my flesh. Perfect my understanding of the Bible. Help me to accept the Bible, whatever it teaches, even if it gets me in trouble. I'm already disliked. I already struggle. I don't want more people to dislike me, but I want to be faithful to Scripture, my understanding of it, for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. Is that clear? Do you want the greatest proof that God has no problem with icons? The greatest proof. Do you know... That Jesus is said to be the icon of God. Colossians 1.15. It says he's the image of the invisible God. And those Greek speakers here will confirm. Do you know what the word image is? Icon. Icon. That's where we get the word icon. Here, you don't believe me? Let me show you what the Greek word is. Ah. And did you know that man is the icon of God? When it says, let us make man in our image. The Greek word is icon, where we get icon. So you, human beings, are living icons of God. How can God be against icons then? Can you explain that to me? Here, let me prove it to you, you guys who don't believe. Here, here's the Greek. Here's the Greek. Click right here. Go look at it. There you go. It says, Haas. I'm going to give the Erasmian pronunciation. Has estin icon to theu, the icon of God who's invisible to Aratu. He is the icon of the God who's invisible. Jesus is the living icon of God. Ron, can you stop insulting me, brother? Okay, growing and nada. Do you worship Mary as a goddess? And do you worship Mary as the mother of God? Stop imposing your understanding of what these people do and believe. Stop, Ron, please. Okay. Did you click on this? Okay, Ron, are you sure praying to her is sin? Do you want me to go back on my sessions about communion of the saints and show that you don't know what you're talking about again, Ron? You may disagree with her with their belief that she was sinless, but Ron, I'm gonna catch you. Is Mary now sinless in heaven? Ron, is Mary sinless in heaven? I'm talking to Ron, not you guys. Is she sinless? Oh, you mean she's a sinner in heaven? So you guys in your filthy, wicked blasphemy think that sinners can dwell in heaven? Is Mary sinless in heaven? Is Mary sinless in heaven? Is Paul sinless in heaven? Is Peter sinless in heaven? Nahab, send Nahab out of here. Bye-bye. Only a fool and idiot would think they're still sinners in heaven. Sorry. I don't have patience for stupidity. Send Nahab out of here. Please. Okay. So what's your problem with someone saying Mary is sinless in heaven 
exalted by Jesus, her son, out of love for her. And we can ask her to pray for us, even though we are not worshiping her. And we don't believe she's the one who answers prayers. But she asked Jesus, and Jesus answers prayers. You may not believe that, but where is it idolatrous? Let me repeat it again. What part of believing that Mary is perfect in heaven, as all saints are perfect in heaven, sinless in heaven, exalted by Jesus, as all saints are exalted in heaven, what part of that would be idolatrous? And what part of saying, we ask Mary to ask Jesus, he answers prayer, not her. She's not answering. We're asking her to have Jesus answer because Jesus answered prayers. No one else, not even Mary. You may not agree with it, but wh where is it idolatrous? Where is it idolatrous? Okay, so JC, let's try this again. If you ask Mary to pray to Jesus to forgive you and to help you, and assist you and deliver you. Just like if I ask you, JC, ask Jesus to help me overcome and to forgive me and deliver me from my upcoming court. Where is that idolatrous? You're not answering my question. Okay, Tisda. If Catholics are wrong that she's sinless on earth, why is that idolatry? You guys still don't understand what you're talking about. See, you guys don't think because you're at, reacting emotionally. Let's try this step by step. If the Catholics think Mary was sinless on earth, they're wrong. Why would that be idolatrous? Being sinless means that they're worshiping her as a goddess? Even if they're wrong about her being sinless, why is that idolatrous? You see, you're not answering the question. Michael is sinless. Does that mean I'm worshiping Michael as a god because I believe he's sinless? Gabriel is sinless. Does that mean I'm worshiping Gabriel as a god because I think he's sinless? So even if they're wrong to think Mary was sinless on earth, why would that be idolatrous? You still haven't explained it to me. Cloudy, please do me a favor. I'm going to block you. I did a series on intercession and communion saints to show that you're wrong. Go listen to it. Don't make me repeat sessions I've already dealt with. Bedros, because of that stupid comment, you're going to get blocked. So Gabriel, who's sinless, I give him the same status as God. Bedros, you better justify what you just said. I'm blocking you. So when I say Gabriel is sinless and Michael is sinless, I'm giving them the status of God? Justify what you said because you're getting blocked, buddy. Quickly, Bedros, because I'm going to send you on your merry way. Quickly, Badros, counting five, four, three, two, one. Send my friend Bedros somewhere else. This is not for him. This YouTube channel is not for him. Badros. Bye-bye. Okay. See you later. I See, this is why I get tired sometimes of teaching. I already did a series on communion of saints. I think it was, what, five parts? And you guys are still bringing up the same objections that were refuted thoroughly from Scripture in those sessions. Why are you repeating the same arguments that are pathetic and unbiblical? I don't get it. Yes, John Doe, I will block him, but you are a filthy Mohammedan. I'm not going to block you. I called you here because I'm going to barbecue and your prophet. John Doe, you mentioned John 17, 3. Guys, I was waiting for this Mohammedan black stone kisser because he thought John 17, 3 refutes the Trinity and proves that Muhammad, the son of Satan, is a prophet. John Doe, now that I got you live and I'm recording you because I'm going to send people your link on YouTube. John Doe, Jesus says, and you admit it, that the Father is the only true God. I want you to type right now, I, John Doe, as a Mohammedan, Worship Allah as my father. Allah is my father, and he's the father of Muhammad. Let me deal with this guy barbecuing because this coward showed up. At least he was more man than Muhammad who hid behind his jihadis. 
Let me digress, guys. Let me deal with John Doe. John Doe, type here. This Muhammadan is going to say, Allah is my father and the father of Muhammad. Type it, John Doe. Come on, John Doe. Don't waste my time. I'm going to send you to Mecca to smooch the black stone like a pagan. Answer, please. My time is running out. No, uh, Harrison, I won't. But I can block you if you want. No, let's say, John Doe, final chance before I send you to Mecca to stone, smooch the black stone. Say, Allah is my father and the father of Muhammad. Say it. I want it here, recorded on live streams. I want other Muslims to say A Muslim said, Allah is my father and the father of Muhammad. Harrison, you need to go, friend. Send Harrison to, to Walmart to buy some Old Spice. Because the, the current spice he has is not working for him. Bye-bye, Harrison. Say it. John Doe, you got one minute. Say it. Allah's my father and the father of Muhammad. Okay. This is why this filthy coward won't answer the question. Because John 17.3 proves that Muhammad is the son of Satan. Because the only true God is the Father of Jesus, whom the Father glorifies in the same way that Jesus glorifies the Father. You see why this coward can't answer? He can't say, Allah is my Father and the Father of Muhammad, even though John 17.3 says the only true God is the Father of Jesus and the Father of all true believers. So this very verse that he used just buried Muhammad further in hell where he deserves to be. Thank you, John Doe, for shaming your prophet, showing that John 17 is Muhammad's nightmare. Thank you, John Doe. So you got a final chance to prove that you believe John 17, verse 3. Say, Allah's my father and the father Muhammad. We're going to count 20 down before we send you to Mecca. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. Seven, six, five. Send this guy to Mecca to smooch the black stone like his wicked pagan prophet used to do. See, I told you one last more than a couple minutes, right? Bye bye. Smooch that black stone. Smoochy, smoochy. You see what I just did with John 17 3? John 17 3. We had someone named Patrick on my comment section not answering John 17 3 the way he should have, either because he hasn't been listening to these broadcasts or. He forgot. Folks, when a Muslim quotes John 17, 3, and that's the passage I was going to deal with, by the way. That was Zachary Naik's favorite passage. I was going to deal with it. When a Muslim, listen to me, when a Muslim quotes John 17, 3, no, see, Riaz, you did the same mistake. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Riaz, how long have you been following my channel, bro? How long have you been following my channel? Okay. No, no, no. How long you uh, you mentioned this? You got caught. You're scared now, and now you're trying to backpedal. How long you've been following my channel? Come on, Riaz. We, we're running out of time. Okay. Why in the world would you go to John seventeen five, which I know our brother James White uses, and ignore? the way I broke down John 17, through, uh, 17 3 in my previous sessions. Are you guys scared of verses 1 or 2? Does your Bible, Riaz, begin at verse 4, so you go to 5, but you forget 1 and 2? No, that's not my argument. See, again, you're pretending to know my argument, Riaz. Riaz, you know, I love you, brother. You don't, you don't want me to bounce. I'm an equal opportunist. I even bounce people that like me because I'm not going to show partiality. That shows you're pretending to know my argument. You don't know my argument. You really don't know my argument. Uh, Deal Remix, I'm a gangster. There's nothing you can do about it. You're a little punk, and I'll muzzle you. There's nothing you can do about it, punk. You can be tough behind the screen and not show your face. Bye-bye, sissy. Bye-bye. Send this guy on his merry way. Yeah, I'm a gangster, baby. 
from the A team. Here he is. Okay. Let me finish. I was supposed to be out here by 5.30. I was supposed to be out here by 5.30. Let me finish the issue of icons, and let me then go into John 17. Folks, please do me a favor. Honestly. The Lord doesn't need me. I need him. And if he wants me to teach, I'll teach. But if I have to repeat the same point over and over again for years, that means either I'm a terrible teacher or you guys are not listening. I have addressed John 17 so many times in my sessions. I don't understand why Christians don't know how to use that argument. I really don't understand. Honestly, I'm being honest with you guys. Okay. It's tiring, honestly. I'm human. I'm imperfect. I'm a sinner. I need Jesus to sanctify me. But when Riaz comes up with these objections, it disappoints me because Riaz pretends to be listening, and he's not. And he's only doing himself a disservice because he's not going to be the most effective apologist for the glory of Christ. He's shortchanging himself. And you're the loser for it. You're losing because you're not listening. You're losing because you're not listening. Okay? Let me tell you why. Number one. Let me show you how to use John 17. Number one, number one. Of course, you're going to tell the Muslim the only true God is the Father of Jesus. And since Muhammad denied that his God is a father, this proves that John 17 exposes Muhammad as an antichrist, son of Satan. So John 17 destroys your religion and exposes your prophet. Done with you. But why do Christians go to verse 5 to explain verse 3? When chapter 17 doesn't start at 3 or 4 or 5, it starts at verse 1. Okay. Let me show you, Riaz, and if you then repeat the same objection again, that means you're not listening to me. You're wasting your time and mine, brother. Let me show you how to use John 17. Are you guys now ready to listen so I can go back to icons and then finish my point? Are you ready? Are you guys going to promise me to listen? Vine, everyone else, I know you guys are getting tired of me. Okay, John 17, verses 1 and 2. Let's start. Anytime someone starts at verse 5, you know what that tells me? You're not listening to me. You've been listening to James White. And nothing against James White. He's a brother. God bless him and use him. But James White's argument is not the most effective against Muslims. It's not. He's great. But when it comes to Muslims, he leaves a lot to be desired. He does. That's just an honest statement. If you keep quoting 5, you're telling me you've been following James White. You're not listening. And you're not going to be the most effective witness against Muslims. And you're doing a Muslim a disservice by not giving them the best apologetic possible for the glory of Christ. And then shame on you. Okay. Now let's go to John 17 verses 1 or 2. One more time. Post it. J. Cab, I only get on my, on my nerves when I have people like you pressing my buttons and trying to challenge me and not listening. Because glory to Jesus Christ, I am perfectly fine by his grace and mercy when I don't have thorns like you in my side causing me to stumble. Glory to Jesus. All right, now let's let's read. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son that thy son, thy son also may glorify thee. Number one, Riaz, you better listen, brother, because if you mention five again and you don't mention this argument, you will really dishonor and disrespect me. Okay? Which creature can demand God to glorify him in the same way that creature glorifies God? Jacob, shut your mouth. Stop barking like a dog because I'm going to muzzle you and now send you on your merry way. Bow wow. Down girl. Send this dog on his way. Okay. Okay. Listen to me, everyone. Everyone here. I had a guy, by the way, take some of these clips and saying, Sam is demonized. Look at him. He's demonized. He's manifesting. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Okay. Listen. Riaz. Which creature can say to God, glorify me in the way I glorify you? Glorify me so I can glorify you. Riaz, which creature can say that? No, there is no creature that's equal to God, Ron M. No creature can say that. Riaz does not respond. Okay, okay. Oh, he did respond. Okay. So then, Riaz, why did you start at 5 and ignore verse 1? Where there Jesus says, Father, glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. So me glorifying you 
is conditioned on you glorifying me. Glorify me so I can glorify you. How dare this creature say that to the creator if he's a creature? Did you catch it? Do you guys catch it? How dare this creature, if he is a creature, say to the creator, glorify me so that I can glorify you. So me, I'm going to glorify you if you glorify me. Who do you think you are? That's number one. Now, let's read it again, one and two. Read it again, one and two. Watch here. One Again, one and two. These words spake Jesus, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, The Father, thou hast come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. So if you glorify me, I'll glorify you. Glorify me the way I glorify you. It's reciprocal. You glorify me, I glorify you. And if you glorify me, then I'll go. Who do you think you are, Jesus? But then it gets better in verse two. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Here's my other question for you, Riaz. What kind of attributes, qualities must Jesus possess to be able to give never-ending, morally incorruptible life to every human being that the Father assigns to the Son? Do you see what he said? Father, you have given me authority over all flesh, so all flesh is subject to me. And... That I, the Son, may give everlasting life to whomever you give to me. As many as you give to me, as numerous as they are, I, your Son, will give them everlasting life. Now, the kind of life he gives them is physical immortality and moral incorruptible, incorruptibility, where they will live forever in indestructible physical bodies and never sin again. And Jesus says, I'm going to give them that life to as many as he gives me. What kind of attributes must Jesus have to make this assertion? Yeah, you guys can answer. It doesn't matter. You guys can answer, but I want Riaz to make sure he answers as well. What kind of attributes... Give me the attributes. Come on. I will give all those you give to me, as numerous as they are, moral, incorruptible, physical, indestructible life, where they will live in physical bodies that are indestructible and will never be able to sin again. I will give all of them. What kind of attributes? Omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. Why? Because he has to know who they are that the Father's given given. Giving him, you know, giving the father is giving to him. Lord, loosen my tongue. He must know who they are. He must know where they're at. He must know how many there are. And he has to have the ability to preserve all of them. So then why, Riaz, do you pretend that you knew my argument? And why did you go to verse 5 and ignore verses 1 and 2? The very first two verses tell us what verse 3 does not mean. Verse 3 cannot mean that Jesus is saying that he is not the only true God, but the Father alone is the only true God in light of what he just said in the previous two verses. Really, Riaz? Now you see they're more powerful than verse 5? Really? If you stop parroting James White's argument and actually listen to the points I make, you would have gotten this. You see my frustration, folks? Yes. Why would I need to explain it? It's plain in Old English. The Father is the one who brings people for the Son to save and raise. What's the problem JC saves? It's the Father who draws people to the Son. Here, come to my Son, and my Son will raise you and glorify you. That's what Jesus says in John 6, 39 to 40. John 6, 39 to 40. So the Father is the one who brings people to Christ, and Christ is the one who then raises them up, and makes them immortal and sustains them forever in union with the Holy Spirit, obviously. Here, that's what Jesus said in John 6, 39 and 40. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all of which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. I will lose none of those that the Father has given me to save. He says, son, here are the people that I want you to save. Father, 
I promise you, I will lose none of them. None of them will perish. I will preserve them and raise them immortal. For the father to trust the son with that task means the father recognizes the son to be almighty God. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to trust his son with the task of preserving everyone forever. And then John 640, let's look at John 640 again. Okay. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So then, folks, you see what Jesus is saying? My Father is the one who brings believers to me. He brings them to believe in me, and then he entrusts me with their fate. The Father has such confidence in me, his Son, that he has confidence I'll preserve every single human life that is entrusted to me, who believes in me, who looks to me, to preserve them immortal forever. John 6, 54. John 6, 54. Whosoever, whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So why in the world, Riaz, and you, Patrick, in my comment section, why do you go to John 17, 5, and ignore verses 1 and 2 of John 17? I don't get it. I understand that you guys have are parroting James White because he made it popular. I'm not attacking him. I don't want him to think I'm attacking him. Verse 5 is powerful, but not as powerful as looking at verses 1 and 2, which immediately precede verse 3. So anytime I see someone quote verse 5, oh, Pedros, you're back, barking. Bow, wow, wow, yippee, yay, yippee, yo. Oh. See, the dog has started manifesting. It's okay, Pedro. Down, boy. All right. You with me there? And he can't keep away. He keeps coming back. And he's wondering. Okay, so Riaz, everyone else. When I see someone quote verse 5, you know what that tells me? You haven't read the chapter. You haven't read context. You've heard James White and you're parroting him. Where am I wrong? Where am I wrong? Where am I wrong? Anytime I see a Christian quote John 17, 5, that immediately tells me, that person hasn't read the chapter, doesn't know the context, and he's parroting James White. You guys need to stop just taking anything I say or anyone says and start reading for yourselves and asking the Spirit to help you understand the context. John 17, 3, the context is not verse 5. It's verses 1 and 2. Why would you jump to 5 and ignore verses 1 and 2? I don't know. I don't get, I really don't understand why. And anytime I see someone go to verse five, I know he's heard James White. And James White is a great brother, used mightily, but I'm being honest. It's not to put him down. His arguments are not the most effective way of refuting the Muslim attacks against scripture. They're not. It's not. They're good, but they're not invincible, irrefutable. With me there? So when you tell me, yeah, I know the argument, Sam. Uh, the Father is the only true God. And No, no, you don't know the argument because that's not the argument. The argument is verses 1 and 2. Let me repeat again. Verses 1 and 2. One more time. Let's repeat it again. 1 and 2. That same context. Jesus says, Father, glorify your Son, me, so that your Son may glorify you. Do you understand? For a creature, that's, that's audacious. The audacity of a creature saying, Glorify me so I can glorify you. You understand? Nothing will work with JWs unless the Holy Spirit convicts them, Zena. But you have to confront them with the fact, how can a creature say to the Creator, glorify me so that I can glorify you? You get what I'm saying? Can you show me Gabriel or any other righteous angel or an apostle saying, God... Jesus, glorify me so I can glorify you. 
Can you show me Moses saying that? Glorify me, Jehovah, so I can glorify you. Notice what Jesus is saying. Glorify me so that I can glorify you. Isn't that amazing to read that verse to see how Jesus begins his prayer? I mean, isn't it mind-blowing? Here, let me tell you how mind-blowing it is. Imagine I'm in your presence. So it can sink in because, remember, we know who Jesus is now because it's 2,000 years later. But imagine a guy shows up. I show up in your church. Guys, imagine. And I stand and I look to heaven and I say, Jesus, glorify me so I can glorify you. What would you think of me? You understand? Your immediate reaction is, this guy is a blasphemer. The guy's nuts. What the hell did you just say? What did you just say? Jesus, glorify me so I can glorify you. You got to be. You, dude, stay away from. You are. You get what I'm saying? And that's what Jesus said in front of these Jewish monotheists, his disciples. And then you hear me say. Then you hear me say, okay, pay attention. Then you hear me say, and you, Jesus, have given me power over all flesh that I may give eternal life to all that you've given to me. Did you catch it? What, honestly, what would your reaction be hearing me say that prayer in your presence in church or anywhere, not even in church? You hear me say, Jesus, the hour has come. Glorify me so that I may glorify you. And you gave me authority over all flesh that I may give everlasting life to all you've given me. Would that not blow your mind away? Would that not blow your mind away? Exactly, Bon. Okay. So then why do we ignore verses 1 or 2, get hung up on verse 3, and run to verse 5 for the solution? Why would we do that? See, folks, I was going to go to a class at 6, but because we got into such deep issues, do you guys want me to stick around and continue? Do you want me to continue, or do you want me to just cancel for tomorrow? If you want, it's already been 92 minutes in discussion. Should I shut down and do another live stream or just continue? Because these live streams have been quite long. You know, there have been over two hours. A lot of people don't watch things for two hours. So do you want me to, if, if should I just continue or should I shut down and start another live stream for another hour? Okay, we'll do another two. But you guys got to promise to come back. We're about 150. I don't want to lose any of you. Okay. So I'm going to do... Zechariah's favorite Bible verse part two. I'll be back on in 10 minutes, God willing. So you guys promise come back, right? Because I want to continue on the theme and about the icons. I'm not done. So I'm going to have to skip the Bible class today. All right. I'm not teaching it, so I'll just skip it. Okay. Well, let's come back. 10 minutes, God willing. Come back, all of you. Invite people so I can upset more people and block more people. The more people you invite, the more opportunity I have to block people. All right? So make my day.